Hello and welcome. Our opening hymn today, All My Hope on God is Founded. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy and in our song we will praise our God. The Collect. God, the giver of life, whose Holy Spirit wells up within your church, by the Spirit's gifts, equip us to live the gospel of Christ and make us eager to do your will, that we may share with the whole creation the joys of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Bible reading is Psalm 91. 
He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him, because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honour him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. One of the unexpected byproducts of the internet is that for the first time there's concrete information available as to what people are thinking. Not that computer technology can actually read our minds quite yet, although sometimes I do begin to wonder about that when I begin typing into a search engine and exactly what I was planning to ask immediately gets suggested. But of course, pretty much every question that we ask our computers does get logged. And every now and then, Google or Yahoo or Bing report what this strongly suggests about what's on our minds. A recent article highlighted in general the most common questions that we ask, which included how to tie a tie, how to lose weight, how many ounces in a cup, and when is Mother's Day? As an increasing proportion of Bible reading is done online too, for the first time we can have clear evidence of the parts of scripture that people are turning to. A recent report on which verses people focused on at the height of the pandemic ranked Isaiah 41 verse 10 as the most searched, read and bookmarked verse on one particular app. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You can do a lot, lot worse than focusing on that particular verse in difficult times. And I guess for many too, Psalm 91 that we heard read earlier would have been an obvious verse to turn to in its looking to the Lord specifically in times of pestilence. And there are many of its verses which we are undoubtedly right to cling on to directly. The psalm writer begins, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I focused in previous sermons on the richness of the image of the Lord as our refuge when times are hard. The picture the psalm begins with of the Lord as a shelter is equally powerful. Wonderful though our world is, for human beings as naked apes, to survive and thrive, it's obvious that in almost every part of the globe, we need to work out how to provide ourselves shelter. In our part of the world, our first thought is of our need for protection from the cold and the rain. Writing in the Middle East, the author's mind is probably more on the need to find some shade to protect against the midday sun. Either way, though God is described in terms which stress his supreme power, the Most High, the Almighty, he's pictured as offering his power to protect us. Amidst the storms and trials of life, the Lord provides a shelter for all who are wise enough to draw close to him and abide in his shadow. Some people, sadly, have the wrong kind of fear of God that drives them away from him. But the songwriter's testimony is that the Lord can be trusted And in doing that and coming close to him, he's found a refuge 
and a fortress. And though the psalm's written as a personal testimony, there's a conviction that the security the writer has found in the Lord is available to others. So he begins by confidently asserting, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, young and old, men and women, whatever our position in life, these blessings are available to all. I'd say the opening two verses of Psalm 91 on their own make it worth turning to amidst all kinds of difficulties, personal, economic, family troubles, and of course in a global health crisis too. Before we go further though, we need to issue a note of caution. This is also a psalm which is specifically cited in scripture as being susceptible to misappropriation. For even if you're not that familiar with Psalm 91 itself, for many, verses 11 and 12 will ring a bell. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Those are the words quoted to Jesus as part of his temptations in the wilderness. You may remember the scenario. In response to the initial temptation that Jesus used his miraculous powers to turn stones into bread, the Lord responds with a very apposite verse from Deuteronomy. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so one of the subsequent temptations doesn't just tempt Jesus with an attractive suggestion, but provides this verse from Psalm 91 to seemingly support the idea. Luke's account tells us, the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus would have known that this was an accurate quotation from Psalm 91. But he knows too that using the psalm in this way will contravene other clear biblical commands. So he replies, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And with that morning in mind, we move on from the opening two verses, knowing that care may be needed to apply what follows aright. Verse 3, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. For some, the caution will very rapidly come to mind. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. The problem with applying that approach to the Bible in general, though, is that the same principle could cause us to discount almost all of the Bible's promises about God's love for the world, about the complete forgiveness that comes through Christ, about the promise of eternal life for all who believe. All these things could just be discounted as too good to be true. For others, as we read these verses, there will be the awareness at the same time that in this pandemic, as in most similar periods in history, believers haven't been immune. Several members of St Andrews have died after contracting COVID, and one of the local ministers too. We'll know as well that Jesus warned his disciples that following him wouldn't mean immunity from trials and persecution. Indeed, it was a distinct possibility that they would lose their lives for their faith. And in every generation since then, there have been those have been martyred out of their loyalty to Christ. So this verse needs to be seen not as a general guarantee of earthly deliverance from trouble, but as related in the first place to God's Old Testament, God's Old Covenant, and his promises there to his people living in the Promised Land. In Deuteronomy 26, along with the promises of blessing and prosperity for the Israelites when they're obedient, there are also warnings of the consequences of their disobedience, including very soberly in verse 21 of Deuteronomy 28, the Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he has consumed you off the land that you're entering to take possession of it. As Israel's history progressed, it became clear that these divine warnings weren't just idle threats either. The nation was defeated and exiled. Most onlookers would have reckoned it was unlikely ever to be restored. But God hadn't given up on his old covenant people. 
In time, they were able to regroup and rebuild Jerusalem. And for those of God's restored people in Old Testament times, there's the promise that God will once again protect them from the fowler's snare and the threat of pestilence if they remain faithful to him. In the New Testament, there isn't that kind of guarantee. But there are promises which, though not so immediately attractive, are in many ways far more significant. That whatever life throws at us, we have an eternal security in Christ. Romans 8 puts it most clearly. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So though as New Testament believers we can't claim immunity from life's hazards, we can pray for protection of course, but we can't guarantee that God will always grant that prayer in the way that we long for it to be uh, answered. But we do have a deeper security, a surer shelter, a stronger refuge, that even the worst earthly afflictions cannot separate us from the love of Christ or unseat us from a place in his kingdom. And so we're right to go back to the assurances that Psalm 91 begins with and see them as being our source of security, living in God's new covenant, inviting others to join us in benefiting from the promise that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, and declaring with God's people in our worship, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We affirm our faith, saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing together, How sweet the name of Jesus sounds after which Jane Machin is going to lead us in prayer.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promise through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Open our minds and win our hearts, that we may love you more purely, and guide us in our prayers, that we may know you more truly and glory in your presence. Give grace, strength and clarity of vision to our bishops, Michael and Matthew our vicar and rural dean Andrew, the clergy, readers and laity who serve you in our deanery. Bless their preaching and teaching and their pastoral care with wisdom, faith and love. We pray for the newly elected General Synod, especially Chris Gill and Leslie Sue. Strengthened for service, Lord, all who you call to serve on General Synod, Deanery Synod, PCCs and committees. Inspire us all to work together within the fellowship of your church. Unite us in following your example that we may reveal your glory to all around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless, O Lord, Elizabeth our Queen and inspire her ministers to rule with wisdom and to seek the common good. God of wisdom, we pray for the leaders of all nations, for those who have lost sight of the vision of a just and peaceful world, for those who want power at any cost, for those whose actions cause poverty and misery. Send your spirit to open their eyes to the plight of those in need and guide them in their decisions. We pray for leaders who have difficult decisions to make, that they will act with integrity and care. We pray for the people who have been affected by war or natural disaster, for those who have lost their homes or had to leave them, for those separated from family and friends, for those travelling around the world in search of a new home. As millions of people cope with the devastation of storms, floods and wildfires, we pray for those preparing for the United Nations Climate Change Conference at the end of the month. We pray for continued advancement in tackling this crisis, that nations will work together so that we may leave this world fit for future generations. We pray that all nations may have courage to fight against what is evil and to nurture what is good in an atmosphere of respect and consideration for others. We are made in your image, and yet each person is unique. We are all different, and yet all loved equally by you. Open our eyes, Lord, to see the person, and not the colour or the disability, that we may live in harmony and peace, and be prepared to learn from one another's cultures and traditions. We pray for the easing of strained relationships, especially within marriage and between parents and children. We pray for those affected by the ongoing crises of COVID, fuel and transportation, for those making decisions, for those working on the front line, for those suffering, for those who have lost their jobs, and those who cannot work. Lord, hear us as we pray for all in need, especially for Peter Swan, Carenza Wood and Jenny Wilde, and for the bereaved family and friends of Alice Slaney. Grant to those who suffer strength in need, comfort in sorrow 
and courage to face the challenges of each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open our hearts, O Lord, to your presence within, our ears to hear your loving call, and our minds to discern your will. Open our hands to receive you and to share you with others. Make us true disciples and friends of your Son, Jesus Christ. With all believers, we put our trust in you and commend ourselves to your gracious keeping. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. blessing. The Lord bless us and watch over us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us and give us peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.